this week on the Back Table Podcast. Going back to like doing radial access in the setting of trauma, which uh, we're not a trauma center at the place that I work, um, but we do see a fair amount of atrogenic injuries. I've kind of stayed away from radial access and trauma, but that was only, I mean, it's not because I'm not comfortable with it, but I always thought like, oh, the vessels are going to be clamped down or I'm going to have a lot of trouble getting into the radial. Is that not the case whenever you have someone? Not unless they are in significant shock. And even okay. if they are in significant shock, a lot of times you can get it. People that have concerns about that, I always tell them if an anesthesiologist can do an art line on a patient with shock, you're definitely more equipped to do it. So you can, you can actually access the radial. All right. Well said. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable Podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back, and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, www.backtable.com. Very easy. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on social media. Let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our medical community, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. Now a quick word from our sponsor. Today's Back to a Podcast is sponsored by Boston Scientific Interventional Oncology and Nebulization Division. Boston Scientific Interventional Oncology and Nebulization is a global provider of medical devices. Boston Scientific's goal is to become the leading partner by enabling and developing minimally invasive procedures. Boston Scientific IOE has recently launched Embold Fibered Coils. These embolic coils are built on the radical idea that simpler is better. With a kinkless nitinol delivery wire, Ability to deliver through microcatheters from 021 to 027, a handle free detachment, and PET fibers providing best in class occlusion. And bold fiber coils give users a reliable coil option that simplifies the complex. Now, back to the episode. Today, we're going to be discussing embolizations. We have already covered splenic embolizations. So today we're going to focus mostly on kidney. And if we have time, we'll get to those some liver and bows. To help us with this topic today, we have Nima Kakabi from UNC. Nima, glad to have you on the show today. Today we're going to be talking about embolizations. We'd already covered splenic embolizations in a couple other podcasts. And today we're going to be covering kidney, if we have time, liver, but probably just kidney. To help us with this topic today, we have Nima Kokabi from the University of North Carolina, UNC, is uh, here to help us today. Nima, glad to have you on the show, man. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, I am a big fan of Backtable, but I never met you guys in person, so thank you for having me on. So it's like a long-time listener, first-time caller? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, funnily enough, actually, I saw Aaron on a flight back from SIR. He was on his way to Paris. I had no idea he lives in Paris. I was like, what a life. He is, he is leading, you know. <laughs> we, just, we just have like a jet setter, CEO, yeah. part-time <laughs> IR doc living in Paris. Yes. Yeah. He's, he's the envy of many. Yeah. All right. So uh, tell us about uh, your practice, your background. Actually, start out. Just give us um, a quick background, like training, where sure. you came up from, sure. and uh, how you found yourself at uh, Chapel Hill. Sure. So I did my undergrad. So I grew, uh, I grew up, I was born in Iran. I uh, grew up in I- Iran until the age of 15, and then we moved to Canada at the time. Um, so I finished high school in Canada, did undergrad in electrical engineering in Canada, did some biomedical engineering projects in the process. Um, so I became interested in image processing and radiology from that avenue. And then I applied for medical school. I actually ended up going to Sydney, Australia for my medical school because I don't know if you're aware or not, um, there are only eight English-speaking medical schools in Canada, so they're extremely difficult to get into and very competitive. So, Hold on, um, so the other ones are French-speaking? All French-speaking, yes. Uh, They're actually more (laughs) French-speaking than English-speaking, even though the French population is smaller um, than significantly smaller than the English-speaking ones. Quite a Canadian nuance, okay. Yes, um, so... um, so I ended up going to Sydney, Australia. One good thing with um, studying in Australia or any of the the Commonwealth countries is that coming back to Canada would be much easier. So that was the idea behind it. Awesome. So um, once I was near finishing our 
in the medical school, I knew I wanted to do radiology, but I became more interested in interventional radiology. And because of that, I decided to do my training, my uh, postgraduate training in, in the U.S. because there were more opportunities. So that's how I ended up at Emory for my residency. I did my fellowship at Yale, and I came back to Emory as an attending, and I just left Emory and joined the University of North Carolina. All right, and quite the route. So at Yale, a lot of trauma at Yale? Fairly, quite a bit of trauma. Not as busy as Emory, uh, because (laughs) um, Atlanta is, uh, yes. There were not as many trauma centers uh, around uh, that we had around Yale as we have. um, So in Atlanta, Emory is in charge of Grady, which is one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. And um, because of that um, and the nature of the much larger city than New Haven, so we saw a lot more trauma at Emory compared to Yale, for sure. But we had a fair share of trauma, yeah. Sure. So I have a a partner that uh, did fellowship at Emory, and he always described Emory IR as a fellow as full contact sport. It is. Who was that? Uh, His name's John Iser. Good guy. Good, good guy. I actually saw John at SIR again. This SIR was a lot. I met a lot of people. Yeah. So I I was a second year resident, I think, when John was doing his fellowship at Emory. He had a lot of funny stories to tell me about his time. That, no doubt about that. He is full of them. All right. So let's get into just talking about, you, you can either, we can kind of borrow from your experience either at Emory or at UNC or both, but just kind of talk about IR's relationship with trauma and how you guys kind of fill into the trauma team. At Emory, we have a very close relationship with trauma surgeons, and I feel that more and more um, they rely on us for even things that you and I probably learned in medical school or even during radiology residency as being surgical cases, including penetrating trauma. Nowadays, I don't know what your experience is, Chris, but nowadays more and more we get phone calls to even deal with penetrating trauma. We had a fair share of that in Atlanta with uh, percutaneous management as opposed to uh, surgical management. Um, So a lot more, in my anecdotal experience, a, a lot more reliance on interventional radiology for trauma, both penetrating and blunt. And um, we, another thing that we had to go through at Emory was that over the past two years or so, uh, the uh, Grady healthcare system was going through recertification for their level one trauma center. So one thing that became significantly more apparent and there was significantly more emphasis on was the availability of IR and documentation of availability of IR in a level one trauma center within 30 minutes of um, the phone call that was being made. So it became even more of a significant reliance, but also from the aspect of documentation and availability, sometimes challenging because Grady was not the only hospital that we are covering. We had other hospitals that we were covering at the same time, but for the most part, uh, for acute trauma, we were there within 30 minutes. Wow. Sometimes, I mean, I can just like see logistically that could be sometimes pretty difficult in Atlanta. I mean, I don't know t- what time like people stay in house or, or how close you have to live, but you know, Atlanta's a big city and yeah. there's a lot of traffic and, but. You know, a lot of times the, the unfortunate truth was that we would get, as physicians, we would get in, but the, the nurses Team, or the technologists right. wouldn't be there by, by the 30 minutes. A couple of times we ended up starting the cases without the IR nurse and we had the nurse from trauma team and sure. ICU helping us. But as as you know, Atlanta is a big city. So this is becoming a, a bigger, more and more, uh, I guess, significant emphasis on availability within 30 minutes to a point that at least when I was at Emory, the thought was that we may need to eventually turn the Grady call into an in-house call to meet that 30 minute standard or expectation wow. rather. Wow. All right. So moving out of logistics, let's kind of dig in a little bit into kidney injury specifically. And we were kind of joking offline, right? Like a lot of alley-oops from people who do kidney biopsies. Yeah. We were kind of joking about interventional nephrology, but uh, let's talk about just uh, kidney injury in general. 
in your practice, um, what was the most common setting for IR consults for kidney injury? Was it really like we were it saying? It was actually, or... I, I was half joking, <laughs> uh, half, uh, you know, the, beh behind yeah. every joke, there is a, a pinch a or an truth. ounce of truth. So to be honest with you, the majority of the traumas that would require intervention, at least, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my experience at Emory, um, and I've seen it, I've heard from uh, other colleagues of mine around the country, the majority of kidney traumas that require intervention by IR or iatrogenic from non-targeted renal biopsies done in the office setting, a lot of times without appropriate imaging. More, nowadays, more and more uh, nephrologists have access to ultrasound, at least doing these renal biopsies. But even in those cases, I feel that the mantra that we follow for biopsies uh, in terms of being in the lower pole, uh, trying to avoid the a areas of high yeah. vascularity in the kidneys, those are generally not followed, <laughs> unfortunately, by nephrologists. And that is why a lot of these biopsies are, at least anecdotally, the number of, of tra traumatic iatrogenic cases that we get from nephrology biopsies are higher than our own. That is not to say we don't actually cause um, renal bleeds, meaning IR doesn't cause renal bleeds post biopsies. Of course, of course. It's in, in my opinion, it's actually one of the more scary biopsies to do, particularly in the setting of renal failure, which is the majority of these cases, particularly, at least in my experience, in the setting of lupus. Those patients in my experience, have bled the most, at least. Um, so um, it is a very humbling procedure to do. People think it's an easy procedure, it's a you know, chip shot, but it can cause a lot of, um, It can. I've seen people die from it, to be honest with you, so. You know, I, I totally agree with you on that, in that when I think about like solid organ biopsies, like outside of the spleen, like give me a, a, a liver or a lung any day, but a kidney, like starting a kidney, sometimes after two or three o'clock, yeah. I'm always, like, especially on in-house patients, I'm always like, ah, oh, where are they coming from? Like, what's their status? Like, what's their blood pressure? I think there's a, I think there's a lot that goes into it, but not to, not to dwell too much on solid uh, kidney biopsies, um, but outside of just kidney biopsies, did you guys treat a fair amount for um, like partial nephrectomies or uh, just either penetrating or blunt trauma? Partial nephrectomy for sure, as well as more blunt trauma than penetrating. Sure. I feel that when it's involving the kidney, uh, again, I don't have the data to back it up, but I feel that when it involves, if there is a, pe a, a penetrating trauma involving the kidney, probably the, the threshold is much lower to go to the operating room. Yep. And so as far as uh, diagnosis goes, um, you suspect a renal bleed. Um, did all of those patients move on to cross-sectional imaging in some way? Are CTAs absolutely necessary or with a high enough uh, pretest probability, would you take some patients to angio straight away? Generally, for renal, we get a CT beforehand. And in the past three years, we actually migrated from having a single phase pan scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis in mostly the venous phase to actually having a two phase arterial and venous phase, which actually increased uh, the pretest probability of a real bleed um, significantly. Again, not backed up by data, but at least anecdotally. But yeah. uh, generally, for those patients, we do um, we do a CT beforehand. The ones that we generally go to a em embolization without a CT are the pelvic traumas. And if they're in shock, a lot of times there's just no time. They're, sure. they're doing much worse, so we go straight to angio. We know they know basically based on an X-ray that there is a open book pelvic fracture. So, uh, and then there's no other, at least visual trauma to the abdomen. So they usually go to, they usually ask us to, to do those in, um, without doing the CT scan. Sure. Um, are they, are those guys using the AAST, um, renal injury scale? Like, is that something that was very much built into the algorithm? Recently in the past two to three years, um, we had a, uh, a, an emergency. So we have an emergency radiology department at Emory. Uh, that um, was uh, working very closely with the trauma surgeons. So uh, because of that, they actually um, made sure that on all reports for solid organ injuries, there is a grading scale that is reported. 
Yep. Yep. And so if anything, if any times, like if active extravasation or pseudoaneurysm was identified, was that, was that almost an automatic call to IR? Yes. Yep. There was. Yeah. Were there any situations where the kidney injuries, where it just looks like an exploded kidney, where those patients move on to nephrectomy or? Yes. Um, I, uh, if there is particularly, if you do a two phase and you don't see any enhancement of the, like if sure. it is a completely evolved kidney, you don't see any enhancement of the parenchyma in the more delayed phase. I think those are very good scenarios that you should not intervene on because there's basically nothing. Either the, the artery is completely transected or maybe the artery and vein are both transected. So in the interest of not wasting time, those patients should go to uh, to operating room directly. Sure. Was the uh, urology service at Emory? I, I guess it would be urology that would take those patients though, or not trauma. Yeah, or? Interestingly, it's trauma okay. uh, that takes care of those patients. That is a grade, yes. Okay. Yeah. Trauma team uh, or trauma surgeons pretty aggressive, like very reasonable and and willing to yeah. open people up. Very okay. good relationship with IR. It's good. Rarely we had disagreement in terms of um, how to manage a patient. Are there any, is, can you paint any scenarios, um, especially for younger IR docs where there are, so it's, I, I think it's sometimes easy to know when to take a patient to angio and it's easy to know when, hey, this is not an IR issue and it, it's more a surgical issue. But are there any um, patients that fall into like, I think this would be more reasonable to watch and wait it, or, or I'm sorry, watch and wait it out rather than to intervene at all? So when there are small pseudoaneurysms, um, a lot of times actually, I remember reading a paper, with, I don't know the exact number, but mm -hmm. post-renal biopsy, if you actually do a, a high quality CTA or angiogram, a very large proportion of those patients have a pseudoaneurysm. But um, we, don't, we don't obviously biopsy all these patients. There, we know that a lot of patients have a small perinephric hematoma that it stops and we just move on and they don't require any further intervention. But just seeing a tiny pseudoaneurysm that there is a no significant hematoma around it, the patient is uh, rock solid, stable with the vital signs, that doesn't require an intervention right away. What, but what you need to do at that point is to follow up those patients very closely maybe do another CTA in 48 hours, and if it's stable, do another CTA in two weeks. Or uh, There's no s real set protocol on how closely you need to monitor those patients, but the bottom line is you need to monitor those patients. Those, those require further imaging, uh, which is still much less morbid than, than subjecting them to, a, uh, to an angiography. And especially for those tiny pseudoaneurysms, a lot of times you cannot get into the sac. You may need to actually sacrifice quite a bit of kidney to, to embolize that pseudoaneurysm. So sometimes less is more for sure. Yeah. Especially like you said, if you painted a scenario where you have a rock solid patient who, it's been my experience, especially with post biopsy patients that even when I go to see them in the post-procedural area, it's almost like you just know they have something going on. Like they're kind of writhing in pain. The blood pressure is, you know, lower than what they were baseline. And they just kind of have a certain look of, of uncomfortableness to them. That's just like unrelenting and not relieved yeah. with like your standard, you know, post-pain medications. And that is part of the art of IR as opposed to the Absolutely. science. A lot of that is really not easy to teach. It's an experience you gain through the years um, and all of us have been subjected to those patients. So I think the more you do, the more you realize those nuances. Totally agree. All right, so say we have a patient uh, either uh, MVC with blunt trauma or iatrogenic, could be post partial nephrectomy. So now you have a patient that you do wanna take to angio. Can you talk, kind of talk about your procedure prep, access, like kind of what you do to get that patient ready to just have an angio and prep for a potential invo. Sure. So I'm a big fan of radial access. I, I All right. never... Radial access, man. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so I was actually not trained, apart from a couple of attendings that I had at Yale, almost everybody else was a growing access or femoralist, as you want to call them. Sure. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't have much of a um, radial experience 
again, apart from maybe 10 or 15 cases I did with a couple of surgeon attendings. So by the time I got to Emory, uh, Zach Berkew, who is one of my partner, who was one of my partners at Emory, he trained at Sinai. So being trained at Sinai, <laughs> obviously, uh, you, you become a radialist whether you like it or not. So um, he basically really taught me different techniques for radial. And I, um, I can tell you, I, I used it. There, there is a bit of a learning curve initially, especially when you're sure. all used to standing on the right side of the patient and I'm right-handed as well. So it is, it is not the easiest learning curve, but once you learn it and you're comfortable with it, I think the quality of the images from radial access because of an extra side hole that most of the radial catheters have, uh, sure. For both liver, I do all my uh, IO cases radial, if if possible. Sure. And uh, for angio, for trauma as well, particularly for pelvic trauma, which we're not talking about today, but uh, because they usually have binders, um, much mm -hmm. easier yes. to go from the uh, much easier to go from the uh, radial, in my opinion. So that was another change that we made in the past two or three years at at, um, at Grady to make sure that people are comfortable taking care of these patients afterwards. So anyways, a uh, long, long uh, roundabout answer to your question, but um, if I can, I do radial access for these patients. So, um, and my, my go-to catheter for accessing renal artery, the baseline, the base catheter is a Sarah or Jackie. Uh, they're yep. actually really easy to use to to select the renal artery, and then you can get good angiography. Generally, you need at least two projection for the kidney to figure out uh, what artery is uh, bleeding and what uh, whether you have to go to the upper pole, middle pole, or the lower pole of the kidney. So once I have that information from the uh, and those angiographies are done with the uh, the the base catheter, which is a five French catheter in the case of Sarah and Jackie. Then I use a microcatheter to to select the renal artery to um, if there is an artery to be targeted for embolization. Generally, if you have significant uh, bleeding, you either will uh, generally you will get a pseudoaneurysm or you get an active extravasation. My go-to embolization microcatheter. Hold on, before before you get into the microcatheter, one thing that I wanted to ask you, like going back to the radial access, radial versus femoral, but it seems like you can, you feel pretty good moving between both worlds, right? Yes, for sure. And actually that's one of my concerns about some of our fellows at Emory, because a lot of us are do, uh, they, we do radial. Uh, luckily we, ha we have, a, uh, we had a good group of people from all over uh, the country. So the, the newer attendings were actually, a lot of them were femoral access people. So our fellows would learn both, but the bottom line is you need to be comfortable with both for sure. I totally agree. But going back to like doing radial access in the setting of trauma, which uh, we're not a trauma center at the place that I work, um, but we do see a fair amount of atrogenic injuries. I've kind of stayed away from radial access and trauma, but that was only, I mean, it's not because I'm not comfortable with it, but I always thought like, oh, the vessels are going to be clamped down or I'm going to have a lot of trouble getting into the radial. Is that not the case whenever you have someone? Not unless they are in significant shock. And even okay. if they are in significant shock, a lot of times, a lot of times you can get it. I, I always, uh, people that have concerns about that, I always tell them if an anesthesiologist can do an art line on a patient with shock, you're definitely more equipped than them to do it, so you can you can actually access the radio. <laughs> All right, well said, yeah. well said. All right, so you were you were starting out, and I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your angiography technique for the the renals. All hand injections with these? Yes, all hand injection. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, the, some people are concerned about uh, atherosclerotic plaques. I so they do two uh, no touch technique which I don't do and I'm not very good at it. I, I've, I, luckily, I have had no issues with um, just selecting the artery and parking my micro my base catheter in the proximal aspect of the renal. Yep. So that was the other thing I was going to ask you if you just fully engage. And then once you do engage, you take an AP and then with your other oblique, is it just based on which side of the kidney? It's just yes. a, an oblique. Usually the, the uh, you do contralateral oblique to right. open up the kidney. Yeah. And it also kind of takes it off the spine. Yes. So after you've done your runs through your base catheter and you've identified either, we said pseudoaneurysm, active extrav, sometimes you see like an AV fistula, 
next step is micro and what do you like for micro next and, step is and micro this, yes and then also like are you picking your micro like do you have an idea of like what you want to embolize with so uh, but depending on the ct um generally you have a fair idea of what you want to embolize with in the kidneys i would say majority of the time at least for me it's um it's coils i generally do coils if i'm treating aml i do alcohol and lipidol if sure. I'm sometimes for larger uh, RCCs that I'm planning to do an ablation, I do a pre-ablation embolization to get better margins and reduce bleeding. And my go-to ablation is cryoablation. So I, I, for larger tumors, there could be a risk of bleeding. But um, if I'm doing that, I use particles. But for sure, trauma sure. purposes, generally I use coils. I, I have partners that use glue as well. But I, I feel more comfortable with coils. Okay. So as far as coils, glue, gel foam, have some of the gel, gel foam on the foam table? Gel rarely in the kidney. Okay. Um, a lot in the liver. That's sure. my go-to in the liver. Unless I see blood pouring out of the liver, I, I feel comfortable gel foam in the whole liver if I have to. But uh, <laughs> Also kidney, pelvic trauma. Also pelvic yes, trauma, oh yes, gel foam. Yes, for sure. Yes. Yeah. That's my go-to. But... For spleen and kidney, rarely, sure. rarely. Okay. Yeah. All right. So coils being the workhorse. Yes. Um, all right. So you've you've got the base catheter done. You have an idea what you're gonna um, embolize with. Um, what do you like for micro and how do you get distal? So generally, for kidney, the vessels are generally smaller than the liver or spleen. So um, you want a smaller micro catheter. So anything from 2.0 to 2.4 is what you should aim for because you have to think about depending on the type of coil you use uh, sure. that you're going to be using smaller coils in general but um reese i would say in the past three years or so when um the uh, true select microcatheter came out by boston scientific that has become my go-to microcatheter for all my IO cases as well as my embolizations. And um, I love it because it's, it takes you to very, generally kidneys are not super tortuous. Sure, um, sure. Right. Like the liver, especially the, uh, the IO cases that have been treated in the past, they become very tortuous, especially if they're on chemotherapy. But um, even in kidney, um, I, I like the True Select a lot and you get good images even if you're doing a selective angiography, because the although the tip of the microcatheter is a 2.0 French, mm -hmm. the distal aspect of it is a 2.8 French, so it gives you that extra volume for your contrast injection. All right, so still getting pretty good pictures. And um, having the smaller microcatheter, does it limit you on which coils you like, or are you fan of uh, detachable versus pushable? So I, I'm a big detachable person sure. <laughs> like detachable coals also. yes just like and i feel most of the younger irs sure. are uh, detachable users and uh most of the older irs are pushable and they probably call us a bunch of wusses for using all these detachable coils but i feel comfortable especially in smaller areas i'd like to have that control that if i don't like the place when i can retrieve it so i i use detachable almost all the time Okay. And with the some of the newer coils that are on the market, um, that whole issue of knowing what size coil you need to use to um, to match that with a certain microcatheter have have been resolved. Particularly, thank uh, God, the, the coil that I like. Uh, that's another issue that we've dealt with in the past with many of the coils that sure. uh, if you're going for smaller coils, for example, you cannot use a 2.7 or a 2.8 French microcatheter because the coil actually forms in the microcatheter right. itself. But um, the uh, the embolded coil by Boston Scientific that came out about a year and a half ago or a year ago now, it actually is compatible for every microcatheter with an inner diameter of from 2.1, I believe, to 2.7. So... Um, that even though the 2.0 French microcatheter, this true select that I use, the inner diameter is 2.1, so it's been okay. I've used anything from a two millimeter coil with a true select all the way to the 32 millimeter coil. Really? 
Yes. What were you doing with it? It was 32 millimeters. So 32 was a, uh, a the renal. pseudoaneurysm um, um, in the, um, that was coming in a patient with FMD that was coming off the pancreatic or the arcade. Wow. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so going back though to like our renal case. Um, so you like the uh, true slick microcatheter, very nice, very slick. And then um, embolds are your coil of choice. That's it. Okay. So detachable coils. So for if you see pseudoaneurysm versus extrav, like do you, does your how you approach those? Is it really any different, or you kind of just group all those into vascular injury, treat it all the same, where you're just doing a vessel takedown? I generally do that. Sometimes I maybe do a touch of gel foam before I do the coil, but generally in the kidney, sure. I, I coil is enough because you you don't have to worry about a collateral vessels. Uh, it, um, in the GDA area, sure. If I'm doing a, uh, if I'm using coil, which is again my go-to, you do the back door. I sometimes do some gel foam in the middle and then do the front door. But generally, in the kidney, uh, coil has been good enough for me. Okay, I like it. How subselective do you get? Is it just? I, I know it s- sounds basic, but um, for like the younger audience, like do you get as absolute distal as possible, and then just kind of take. You try to leave as much kidney on the table exactly you, yeah. you want to keep as much of the kidney but you again you have to have the context of the clinical picture of the patient in mind as well i had an attending at at yale who would tell us life over kidneys anytime <laughs> they asked us uh oh but the, the the patient has renal failure can we give contrast blah 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 uh, so and the, uh, the, you got you have to put that in context that if the patient is crashing on the table you may not be able to be as selective as possible, but obviously try to save as much of the kidney as you can. Sure, absolutely. So after you do your coils, so you got your coils deployed post-injection, like um, do you do one through the microcatheter and the base yes. catheter? Okay. I do both. I do yes. one through the microcatheter because the idea with that is that if there is anything left to be done, you can sure. uh, continue with the coiling. And if, if everything is good, I am. I'm also a big fan of doing another injection through the base catheter because sometimes you may be fooled with the microcatheter that yes the flow is um the 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 flow through the the vessel that you're embolizing has stopped but then you do your injection through the base catheter and actually it has not let me ask you this um how long do you wait from embolization to your post runs or so it is a quick take down that's another thing I like about embolt because it is a fibered coil. Oh, they're fibers? Yes, they are. Okay. So it's similar to the interlock, but um, I never liked using interlock because um, because to me it wasn't a really truly detachable coil. Once you had yeah. pushed it out of the microcatheter, you could never retrieve it. But sure. uh, people that use it, uh, it's very popular, particularly among the vascular surgeons, the interlocks, because... Um, a, it comes in an O35, um, um, O35 platform as well. But the more important thing is the f- that the fact that it has fibers, and a lot of times they use it for pre-EVAR. It actually, you end up using less number of coils. You don't have to get a perfect filling of the vessel or the pseudoaneurysm right, right. that you get to get a cessation of flow. So generally, the embolization is quicker in ter- when you use any coil that has fibers on it, which inter, uh, which um, both interlock and the embolt coil, uh, which I use now for most of my embolization, actually has that. So uh, particularly, that's important in the setting of a, um, a patient who has um, hemodynamic instability and hemorrhagic shock. You want to be as quick as possible. So that's one of the advantages of it. So, uh, and then the other thing that I like about it is the fact that it actually is the only coil that I know of on the market that actually the pusher is nitinol. So I'm very impatient. I don't know about you, Chris. When I'm, I'm pushing these coils yeah. in, I want to go as fast as possible. And a lot of times I end up bending coils that are actually on a non-nitinol base. And I say for the first time, there is a coil that I can push as fast as I can. And I can totally bend it even 180 degree and it doesn't actually kink. So so that's another advantage of uh, the embolt coil that I like. Okay. 
So how long do you wait? So after you uh, embolize, like it's, so, it's, it's almost immediate or? Um, so with the fiber coils, I give it about a minute to two. Okay. With yeah. the met, uh, purely metal coils, uh, you need to probably do more coils because you want to get sure. complete filling because you're solely relying on the, the, the metal to stop the blood flow. But generally with the metal, I would say about four to five minutes before I make a decision if I need, need another coil. Whereas with the fibers, about two minutes. Yeah. Sometimes that two minutes and that five minutes, is, I know. That can be, yeah, that can be a long time. I know. <laughs> but again, I'm not, I'm not waiting between every coil of course, two or five course. minutes. Uh, yes. When I After feel visually that it yes. is good enough for that vessel, then that's the time I would wait. Yes. So special considerations, um, is there any like conversation around, or if you have any clinical scenarios where you have patients with, uh, you know, nephrostomy tubes and they're having hematuria, but you can't find the bleed with the drain in. And it's similar to like when you have it with like same thing with biliary drains, do you do anything different? Like where you have them prone and then you take out the drain, do angio. So, um, that's actually another good um, for people that are radial fans. Yes, that's yes, another exactly good uh, uh, application for doing an uh, uh, angiography through a radial access because um, this whole, unlike the liver, which is much easier if you have a biliary drain and they have hemobilia, to do an angiography with the patient's supine, you can remove the catheter over wire and then do another right. angiography. With kidneys, it becomes very difficult to do that. So if you put them in a, um, in a, prone position you can easily actually access the renal uh, the the radial artery with the right. uh, with the arm of the patient on their side and then um, go into the kidney do an angiogram with the nephrostomy tube in place and then if you don't see anything remove the nephrostomy tube over the wire and then repeat that angiogram so i think that's another for people that are not a believer in radial access that's another good um, application for it i think that's actually super elegant um, solution. I've never had to do it, but I've always, it, but I feel pretty comfortable with radial and I've always known that it's in my back pocket. I, I've kind of feel like similar to you, Nima, about radial access that, you know, it's not appropriate for every case, but it's kind of, it's kind of a good fit for some patients. And if you're, if you're comfortable in both worlds, I think that you can find some, you know, there's going to be a lot of clinical scenarios that you're yeah. going to be glad you have it in your back pocket. I think you sh as a as a trainee particularly, and I know you have a lot of trainee fans who listen to you guys religiously. I think you should make every effort to become proficient at both techniques because a lot of times one can, in very difficult situation, one may be a better option than the other. So you would like to have both proficiencies in your back pocket for sure. All right. So anything that I didn't cover in terms of embolization or technique, because I was going to move on to post-care, anything I missed that you were thinking, Nima? No, I think it was very comprehensive. Thank you. All right. Um, so post-care, um, standard angio precautions, clearly. Um, I would like to know, like, how long do you stay on board for trauma injuries? Like, how long do you continue to follow patients? And like, when do you kind of sign off the service? Because, you know, these trauma patients can hang around for a pretty long time. They yeah. have a long road ahead of them. And so I was just curious, like, how long they stayed on service? So uh, admittedly, a lot of IRs, including my myself and my group, a lot of times we don't do a very good job of following these patients for at least an extended period of time. And you know, we're busy, we, are, um, we, we get uh, uh, all these other consults that we have to do. And these are patients, as you said, that stay sometimes in the hospitals for months because of all the other distracting injuries that they have. So Generally, we do one to two days of follow-up, and then if they're stable uh, from the standpoint of the area that we worked on, we sign off on them. But um, a lot of times I learn from my cases when I go back and look at them for presentation purposes that actually, oh, a lot of things have happened that I wish I knew if I, sure. if I was following the patient. So my advice is the the longest you can follow, the longer you can follow the patients, the better. But uh, we all have to be realistic in terms of the, the world we live in. So a lot of times we don't have those options, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but bare minimum, um, you guys at least stay on one or two days to yep. check access sites and make sure like patients are For clinically sure. stable. Yep. And I guess in the trauma setting, almost all of them end up either on a trauma floor or um, high, in, high acuity floor, right? That's correct. Yep. yep. Anything else that I didn't mention in terms of like, you know, I sometimes think um, 
kidney injuries, um, you know, any reason to track GFR? Are there any labs that you kind of look at after? But really, like, you know, when you're thinking trauma, I mean, I, I kind of feel like over you, you know, choose life over kidney and that, you know, it's you want to preserve as much kidney as function. You want to reduce your contrast load. But in the end, you really have to stop a bleed from a patient yeah. who's acutely ill. No, uh, just um, I would, again, go back to biopsy. I know this wasn't a biopsy <laughs> talk, but uh, be very vigilant with biopsies when uh, for the trainees in the audience. Uh, uh, watch those patients very carefully. A lot of times, if I'm worried about a bleed, I would keep the patient for another five minutes on the table post biopsy and repeat it. And if the bleeding hasn't increased in size, then I would uh, let them go to the post procedure area. But um, be very, um, be very scared of renal biopsies is what I'm going to say because um, they can they can um, cause a lot of trouble for the patients if they bleed. So I think that's very telling, especially for the younger audience, like the trainees, I'll drill down on it, um, like Nima did, in that, like, so we're talking about embolizations for trauma and kidney, but really how we started and ended our talk was about, just be careful with kidney biopsies. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Nima, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, any uh, final thoughts or um, anything I didn't mention that uh, you wanted to bring up? No, thanks, Chris, for having me. And um this is this is great. I've personally learned a lot from your back table podcast. So keep up the good work is all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, as long as we have good IRs like you who are willing to come on, donate some of your time with us, um, we're going to keep putting it out there. So we really appreciate it. Oh, you and can that count goes on to, me. <laughs> all right. Thank Anytime, you, Nima. Yes. And that goes to all of our hosts out there who are listening. We really appreciate you guys and to our audience. Also, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show but want more, uh, check out the show notes of this episode. We're going to put some up. We have a lot of people that work very hard on those. You can find those at www.backtable.com. And remember, the show notes are where you can also find a link to get some free CME. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, or share this podcast on social media, or just go old school, tell a colleague about it. Um, word of mouth goes a long way to um, help us continue to build this community. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Nima, thanks for coming on the show, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts, Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 